stepping up our game in relation to service. Because the retail business, it's a very busy space these days. Kind of like that. That's a pool in China, if you're wondering what that is. So that's kind of what the industry is in relation to not only your competitors in the actual segment, but the other competitors who are now entering our segment. So we're thinking that how can we look at our, our business and how can we learn from people who are in it? So stepping up our game, I have a few questions. We, Kevin started to talk about this yesterday, but I'd like to explore this a little bit more. How many people in this room believe that they have 100% satisfied customers? No? 90%? OK, few for 90. Keep your hands up, 90%. How many have 75%? OK, we're almost at the majority of the room. How many have 50%? And wait, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. And how many people have less than 50%? That should be everybody. OK. So now the question is, is how do you know that? Feedback? What kind of feedback? How regular is that feedback? What's the mechanism in place to determine whether you have satisfied customers or not? Do you have one of these at the exit of your store that allows the customer to just go, I'm happy, I'm not happy. What's the mechanism that allows you to, to know that? Because we all have a, an opinion as to how satisfied our customers are, but how do we know? Do we use services like a reputation management company or a reputation management department that that's their job? to know how satisfied your customers are. I'd say most people don't have that. Do you use services like Google Alerts or TweetDeck or Tracker or Brand.com to know what are people saying about you? And it's not just what people are saying about you in front of you, it's what are people saying about you when they're at a dinner party, when they're with their friends. Those are the questions that we need to ask because that's when the truth is coming out. In 2010, 78% of surveys that was done by Google said that they um, felt that it was very important to look up somebody online and see what their reputation is before doing business with them. Imagine what that number percentage-wise is going to be in 2014. 90%, 95% of people are going to look you up, not just on your website, on social media, around the uh, what's online, what's being said about you, what's being said by their friends. Are you confident that this is not you? Don't fly British Airways. Customer service is horrible, says one person out there. But how many people have seen this message and understand that that's the truth? Because it's out there. It's on the web. It must be true. How confident are you that that's not the message that's being said about you? The reality is, is that there's often a disconnect. According to us, our customer service is great. Well, I'm the customer, and I think your customer service stinks. There is that disconnect. And how do we know that it's there? One thing I hear all the time from people in this industry is, well, my customers are loyal. They'll follow me to the end. Uh, if I tell them to jump off a bridge, they will. Um, in fact, swimmingpoolacademy.com, the leading uh, information service in our industry, has done a huge survey of customers. And with the customers who are seen as loyalists, they themselves even see themselves as loyal customers to a store, 51% of them have claimed that they're not extremely satisfied with the store they're shopping at. When you look at non-loyal customers, so just your casual customer comes in, 82% in our industry in the pool business walking through your doors are not satisfied. So that doesn't really match the expectations of the understanding of where we stand based on the hand raising in this room. So my personal experience with it in our stores, um, Aquantica was the name of the store, we did certain things and we were sure of things. And one of the things we did, we were available to customers 12 hours a day, seven days a week. We had people even with pagers overnight. Uh, I went to their house personally when there was a problem. If there was a problem with our work, we'd return that night. We'd send the technician back because the customer called us and said, hey, what's going on? He left it on backwash or something to that effect. Tried to perform service calls within five days of their call. We'd match prices if somebody was complaining about pricing. 
I didn't charge them if there was something wrong. Oh, that's okay. Yes, we screwed up. I'm not charging you for this service. How could you do any better? I thought, literally, that we offered the best service in town. But we, we really thought that the, when a customer came in, you know, you get that almost a, a defensive feel. It's like, wow, uh, they must be crazy if, if, if they don't want to come back here. It's not what we're doing. It's, it's what they're doing. It's what their expectations are, I guess. I, I really felt like we were doing this. I mean, how many people in the room feel like, you, you know, you're, you're doing everything you can for your customers, right? It's, it's that feeling like, wow, we, we really bend over backwards for them. But it still doesn't mean we're meeting their expectations. Again, maybe at the dinner party, maybe in the elevator, maybe talking to somebody else, this is actually what their faces are. They're not satisfied with it. What ends up happening is we end up operating often in what I, is considered to be the, the zone of tolerance. It's the level between what their desired service is and what's adequate. Usually adequate will allow them to keep coming in, keep coming in, keep buying from you, but their expectations are somewhat higher than what we're actually providing. So why does this occur? Well, their expectations just are not constant. So it's something that we always have to adapt and keep changing. And a lot of people, when you set up your business, you set up your, your protocols for service and that when you first start. But you don't look at it annually and understand what do we need to do this year to change to adapt to the changing expectations. So expectations have changed. 44% of people in today's market expect excellent service. You know how it used to be, oh yeah, I'll pay a little bit more for excellent service? Well, no, now it's I expect excellent service without paying more. Here's an, a, a good example. They were talking about the guy complaining about British Airways. Well, the reason he's complaining is because the social media service is not available 24 hours a day. So it's not, they lost my bags. It's not, they weren't on time. It's not, I didn't get peanuts. It's, your social media wasn't open 24 hours a day to help me out. How many people really expected that they were complaining about, oh, they were late or uh, the flight attendants yelled at me? I mean, that's the expectation that, that we would have thought about poor service. But here's a guy that is telling the world that this is the worst airline in the, uh, to deal with, and it's mainly because their customer service wasn't available 24 hours a day. So how do you know what expectation level to set, and how can we try and better understand how to deal with that? Customers have basically evolved, and they have so much more information than we give them credit for, and that perhaps we even take the time to get. So we have to make sure that you know we evolve equally and not like that. Come on, that, that was a pretty tough visual to find. <laughs> Look up, try and find that one when you get home. Um, so the conditions under which we could provide just adequate or tolerable services is basically gone. The expectations change so quickly, especially in today's world, because people now are able to talk to anybody and anyone wherever they want, whenever they want. And in fact, the more turbulent an industry is, the more changes there are, the more competitors entering the market, the more likely a customer is going to move on to somebody else. And our industry, some of the things that are happening, the new people that are coming in, is very turbulent. So it's time, when turbulence, fasten seatbelts, and get ready for the, the big changes. So how do you know that there's a disconnect between you and your customers? Well, here's a little quiz to see if, if you are perhaps not on the same page. If you answer yes to three or more of these questions, it's fairly likely that you are operating in that zone of tolerance and your customers may come back tomorrow or they may not. So first question, do you feel that you have to compete on price? If you feel that you're competing on price at all the time, there's a pretty good chance. Are the services you offered the same as those that you offered five years ago? If you haven't changed and you haven't adapted, fairly good chance. Are the service you offer similar to those of your competitor, or if theirs is regular service, is yours white glove service of some sort? Is it very similar? Are you basically the same company? Are you having a hard time finding employees who go that extra mile, who go beyond the call of duty? Have your competitors introduced things that your customers are talking about? Oh, well, so-and-so does this. 
oh, I heard that so-and-so does that. If they're comparing you to somebody else, that's a pretty good sign as well. Are you spending a lot of time dealing with angry customers? People coming in and again, telling you in another way through yelling <laughs> that their expectations are different than what you're providing. Are your customers, um, prospects, or employees confused about what it is that, that we do that makes us different from our competitors? Or are they just going into a building that could be any building, any address, any pool store? What makes you different? And how do you explain that to your people? And one thing that I find, is it the rules that are defining the customer experience? You're out, you're busy, you're doing your thing, running your part of the business. Are the people who are left in the, in the store, do they have the power to give that customer the service that they expect? Or is it defined simply by rules? When this happens, do this. When this happens, do that. If you answer yes to any three of those, it's fairly likely that your business is operating in the zone of tolerance. And we need to figure out ways to step outside of that. So where can we start? At this point, I'd like to introduce some of our panelists and they can explain what their experience has been and what they've been able to do and where their particular experience specific to customer service. So Brett comes to us from the uh, West Coast, uh, from West Coast Spa Service, Pools and Service. Pools and Spas. Pools and Spas now. Um, has recently opened some retail stores and has had uh, some significant growth in his business. So I welcome him and actually, yeah, we may as well just remain uh, seated since you're nice and comfortable there. And uh, tell us a little bit about your experience and you can use that. All right, thanks, Ron. Um, I've probably got about 10 hours of content here to uh, <laughs> squeeze into 10 minutes. So I'm gonna breeze through it really, really quickly. Uh, for most of you who don't know me, my name's Brett Maud. Uh, I own West Coast Pool and Spa, uh, which is a service-based company in Vancouver. Um, I'm a second-generation pool guy, and I've got a bit of a unique background with 25 years experience as well as a uh, Bachelor of Engineering degree. So that's my background. Um, today I'm going to give you a real quick insight to my business and explain how meeting customer expectations has been integral with our operations. So uh, 15 years ago, I joined West Coast Pools. It was the, uh, the quintessential pool company. We had about 170 maintenance contracts, uh, five employees, and probably processed about 50 jobs a day. Um, utilizing systems and processes, I introduced a corporate culture um, which focused on quality service, or as Ron says, meeting customer expectations. I had uh, unbelievable results. Uh, as the slide shows, it, within 10 years, uh, we built the company up to 1,300 weekly maintenance contracts, had about 65 employees, and we were processing upward of 450, 500 jobs a day. In Vancouver, it was commonly known that if, uh, if you wanted the best, call West Coast Pools. They cost a lot more than everybody else, but they're worth every penny. So what that allowed us to do is uh, we were able to increase our margins, and we were able to be discerning about our customers and the, uh, and the work that we undertook. Now's my experience. It was right about then that the, uh, the wheels fell off. So uh, just like all rapidly uh, growing companies, uh, the expansion also nearly sent us bankrupt. And the, un the, the underlying reason was we were no longer able to uh, provide quality service. We grew too big and we lost control. We're still surpassing expectations, but uh, it was on the wrong end of the spectrum. Basically, our problem was, um, aside from all the financials, um, is that our workforce grew too large too fast. So not having been part of the growth, our employees forgot what it took to provide quality service and what, uh, what defines it. So slowly but surely our service declined. Uh, we lost customer confidence. Um, we're practically encouraging customers to question our work, do their own research, uh, price shop. Um, we really force them to, uh, to question the value for money. And of course, uh, slowly they started to ask for discounts and cancel contracts make things worse at the same time was the emergence of big box stores and uh, online retailing. Mm -hmm. 
So with all this, you probably ask, well, why are you up here uh, talking about quality service? <laughs> so the truth is I did turn the company around and I spent probably hundreds, if not thousands of hours analyzing what constitutes quality service, what brings success, and also what results in failure. I don't call myself an expert uh, on the subject, but I think I'm qualified enough to speak here. And uh, I also hope that some of my experiences can, uh, can benefit you. So um, on a broad spectrum here, uh, how did I, I turn the company around? Well, I, uh, I completely restructured the organization. Um, I focused back on quality service and I implemented an IT-based automation program um, to ensure that we could surpass expectations on a grander scale. It's still a work in progress, it always will be, um, but I can honestly say I'm starting to see the fruits of, of the efforts. Again, having just 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a real fleeting glance of my business um, and I'm going to talk about what's worked for me for quality service, and then uh, Dan is going to speak about the benefits of uh, IT automation in the service department. So uh, I really hate to say it, it's such a simple concept, but the, uh, the, the true foundation of quality service is professional employees. Easy, right? You got a team of motivated uh, employees and the rest comes easy. Not so much. The, um, the problem is that, as we all know, we're in an unregulated and uh, unrecognized industry, so these employees generally don't exist. They must be developed. It's a, uh, a long and costly process. So uh, how did I do it? Again, it wasn't easy. Um, what I did is I completely re redefined my company, uh, increasing our professionalism so that I would attract quality individuals whom then I could train and mold. And in doing this, uh, I'm just going to quickly breeze through the, the, the main key points of, of what I did. Uh, the first thing is, is I generated corporate documents. Um, I wrote corporate summaries, corporate intent, strategic objectives, and I drew a, uh, a corporate structure. And in, by doing so, what I did is I represented uh, who I was, uh, what I represented and what I wanted to be. Um, you know, I set my goals and I drew the plan to get there. When, uh, when employees are looking for work, they want to join a, a, a stable company and they want to join a, a company that has a future. I find that these uh, corporate documents are, are key for me to entice and secure those talented uh, individuals. Second thing I did is I developed a human resource program. So I wrote positional descriptions, um, job advertisements, employee contracts, and a, uh, and a corporate handbook. Uh, I use them to clearly state my expectations for everybody that joins my company so that I can set up a professional relationship with them from day one. Thirdly, I never stop training, ever. Um, I establish uh, career paths for my key employees and I never stop training them. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money. Um, a lot of you out there probably think that it's, it's just not worth it, they're going to fail anyway. Um, what I do is I said I, I find my key employees and I enter them into a, um, it's called a, a return of service agreement. So generally what it is, if I give them third party uh, training, if they leave within a certain amount of time, then they repay the company for that training. Um, what it does is it takes the risk out of training for me. Uh, finally, I develop a retention plan. Generally what that means, I get to know my employees, I get to know what makes them, makes them tick, and uh, I focus on that so that I can retain them. What I've found, it's generally not money. Money helps. But um, what I've found, it's uh, stress loads, keeping stress loads down for my employees, and work-life balance. Um, moving along, so now just sort of focusing in on the service part of things, uh, a key component is managing your service department. So um, for me to get optimal performance out of my techs, and I have uh, 14 service techs and 25 maintenance techs right now. 
um, I've found that you know you, you have to carefully manage control and, and support them. So a couple of things which really work for me is uh, be proactive. I know everyone in the room in the middle of summer, you get that phone call, you cringe, and it's like, oh no, Mrs. Brown, geez, I bet she's phoning to, to bitch about that job we just did. Mm -hmm. We all get them. That's the mentality that I've eliminated from my company. If you know there's a problem, I've uh, communicated to all my staff, if you know there's a problem, take a deep breath, pick up the phone, and call Mrs. Brown. And if you have to apologize, do so. Uh, don't focus on price. Mm -hmm. And uh, resolve the issue. You'll find that by you making the phone call rather than her calling you, it'll be a, uh, a civil conversation. And more often than not, she'll actually thank you for making the call. Secondly, what we, uh, what we do is we make appointments and we keep them. So we schedule out um, a week, sometimes two weeks in the summer, uh, our appointments. And we've found that the customers appreciate that they're being taken care of. Yeah, they bitch. They, uh, they don't like being waiting for a week, a week and a half. But at least they, they know they're not being ignored. Mm -hmm. um, the key factor on that one is make the appointment and keep it. Because if you... Uh, book it out two weeks and then don't meet that appointment, big trouble. The third one, which, uh, which maybe some of you can adopt, maybe you already, already have, is schedule smart. So um, it's easy to overbook your techs, stress them out, and uh, put unrealistic schedules onto the board. What we've found is we use it's, uh, a 75, 50, 25 program. So for all our techs, we schedule out 75% of their workload for tomorrow. 50% for the day after, 25% for every day there after that. And what that does is it allows for repeat calls on a, on a service call and it also allows you to deal with that, uh, that squeaky wheel. And most importantly, it really gives you a, uh, a great insight to where your service department is. So getting near the end of my 10 minutes run, <laughs> um, let's really focus on what most companies probably think is the most important part of, of quality service, but it's really only the end product. That is the actual service call. Most of the work goes in the, into the preparation as I've described for a service call, but being the end product, it's the only thing that the customer sees. It's the only thing they judge you upon, it's the only thing they remember. So what we've done at least is we've set a uh, defined set of protocols for a service call. Um, this is probably not alien to any of you there. Our protocols uh, in brief are, you know, ensure the techs are well presented. So wear a company t-shirt, name tag preferably, um, make sure they shower in the morning, make sure they smell good, and make sure they're clean. Um, Secondly, maintain organized trucks and tools. So we have a, a, a new clean fleet. Um, we make sure that we've got an inventory of tools so that when our tech drives up the, uh, the driveway, it's, you know, the truck's not leaking oil on the driveway. The customer's first impression is good, gets it off to a good start. Thirdly, uh, a real key one for me that I'm always talking my techs about is, is show up on time. We set specific times, not a.m., not p.m., not 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. We're going to be there at 3.30, and my techs are instructed to show up at 3.25. It's tough. You can't always meet those appointments. So what we've found is, is if you phone the customer um, half an hour, maybe an hour in advance, and say, look, I'm really sorry, running a little bit behind schedule, we're going to be 10 minutes late, more than happy to, uh, to accommodate. They'll thank you again. For introduce yourself. So I have all my techs walk up, knock on the front, knock on the door, uh, introduce themselves, look them in the eye, smile. Uh, what it does is it, it gives a little bit of a, a personal touch to the service call, and uh, customers are a little more willing to open up their wallets when they get the invoice. Uh, act professionally. Common sense. I, I really don't think I need to go into that one. And then the last one that uh, that I've had great success with is. Communicate results and proposals while on site. Customers are impatient these days. Uh, they don't want to wait a day. They don't want to wait a week for a proposal. 
So what I've done is I've uh, equipped all my techs with laptops on the road. Uh, those laptops are loaded with work templates is what I call them, which is just any sort of work that they do. So they're equipped to generate a proposal right there on site and they're instructed to verbally deliver it to the customer, whether it's in person or on the phone. Um, quick side note, that same thing also converts a lot of non-billable time to billable time. So that's a, a, an added benefit. So I am nearing the end of my time, Ron. Um, so that's pretty well like an absolute fleeting glance at my business. Uh, I, I could honestly speak here for eight hours or you could dedicate a conference to it. Um, I know that everyone here has different companies uh, with different demographics, so I wouldn't expect all of my solutions to, uh, to work for all of you, but maybe just a couple of things that I've sort of touched on, you know, you could adopt into your, uh, your businesses. Um, if you do want any further information on anything I've mentioned, by all means, I think we're going to have a question period here. So put your hand up, uh, Dan and I'll try our best. Um, stop me if you want to talk. Uh, it's something I'm passionate about. I'll be more than happy to spend some time doing so. Or uh, my email address is right there on the screen. Feel free to, uh, to jot that down and by all means, uh, send me an email. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll have a question period at the end. Dan is just going to expand upon the, what is it that, from his experience, what is it that uh, is the key importance in, as Brett had mentioned, that the automation side of it is, is very important. So Dan's going to spend a bit of time telling us about that. And I'm going to get us caught up time-wise really quickly because <laughs> my presentation won't be nearly as long. Um, I get pigeonholed as a software guy. Right? Everyone thinks that I'm Dan, the Evesis guy, and the, the reality is uh, I have been with Evesis for seven years. Um, but before that, I've been in the pool industry my entire adult life, never done anything different. I've had the uh, pleasure of operating some really large service companies. Um, and certainly over the last seven years, it's been my job to have conversations with thousands of pool companies about how to uh, improve their processes. And I really am a process and procedure um, guy. I give this talk regularly, and like uh, Brett said, I can spend all day um, having conversations about this, but um, for me, it always comes back to the basics. I'm going to tag on to some of the things that Brett said and um, say that, um, of course, you need to train. You need to have policies and procedures in place. But for me, getting my service department really efficient um, circled around the fundamentals, how can I best send that guy out the door with the information that he needs, fully prepared um, to do that? So <clears throat> be honest about this. How many of you are still handwriting service orders? It's the way we've done it since the beginning of time, right? Every day we print out this stack of papers and write some notes on it, and we hand it to our guys, and then uh, eight hours later they bring in a stack of papers in and they hand it off to someone, put it in somebody's inbox. Who's the inbox? Right? And in the summertime, you're a week behind schedule of getting it all, um, you know, getting it all built out. The problem with that system is that <clears throat> you have a really difficult time getting your technicians enough information to truly be prepared. So if he has to spend 10 or 15 minutes per call figuring out what's going on, getting to the, you know, the nitty gritty of the service call, those 10, 15 minute increments really add up and uh, are a drag on your, on your business. So, um, I really focus on the fundamentals. Um, I'm a big fan of the um, uniform. How many of you are using um, you know, professional uniforms in your business? Um, yeah, I would imagine all of you have dress codes, um, and that's great. To a certain extent, your weather dictates um, some of that. I'm from Florida where it's not uncommon to get out of a, to be at a gas station and see a service guy get out of a truck wearing cutoff jeans and flip-flops. It happens every day, and I'm always astounded that people will let that guy in their backyard, but they do. Um, so, I really like uniforms. I really like the um, name tag, the professional uh, um, name tag, like the airline type name tags. And I don't know if you guys have considered it, but I know other groups in the U.S. at least have um, certification programs. 
So you guys are big on branding. It's all about IPG. Why not have embroidered service shirts and jackets that say, you know, IPG certified um, service technician? <clears throat> Those kinds of things really add credibility um, to your service. Obviously, training is important, um, but um, I really try to focus on the paperwork versus the um, versus the technology. So here's just some examples, obviously, of um, some of the service companies that we do business with and the um, the look that they present. Um, if you're handwriting service orders, um, again, you're probably not getting your technicians as much information as we need. This is an actual um, spreadsheet that format that I've used in the past, where across the bottom of those uh, tabs are different service calls. So you could create a tab for um, every, you know, your top 20 most common service calls, right? And what are the six, seven, or eight questions that your technician wants to know about that specific service call before he ever goes out on the job? Does that make sense? So you could literally set up a service template here, um, ask the questions that the technician wants. My view is that everybody in your business should be able to take a service call. So how many of you transfer people to the service department when they call? Your retail staff transfers somebody on the phone or you have a separate phone number? Um, you know, we've all done it that way. My view is every time I put somebody on hold, every time I transferred them, every time I gave them a different phone number to call, that it was an opportunity to, for them to go do something different. So in my business, every person, down to the guy that emptied the trash, if they picked up the phone, they knew how to take a service call. And you can use this format. I'm not up here to, you know, obviously I'm here to sell my software, but you don't have to use my technology. I, I get it. Um, but some technology. So the ability to take these service calls and get your um, technician's information um, is critical. Um, the second challenge um, with the stack of paper is getting information back. Um, technicians are who they are. And again, you hand out this stack of paperwork every day, and they chicken scratch all over this paperwork. And so somebody's got to transcribe the chicken scratch and get it back in the system. And it's just an inefficient way to, uh, um, to operate. So there are technologies out there available where you can have your technicians um, take um, uh, really detailed inspection reports, equipment condition information. And if you want to talk about a way to build your business, giving feedback to your clients about you know, what's going on at their uh, job, you, you address that very thing. So they want to give the technician as much information as they can going out the door, as complete and as um, solid a foundation as we can with the service call, but we also want to get information back from them. So there are technologies out there that allow you uh, um, to do that. I got those slides reversed, but here's um, all the information this technician needs. They know whether the guy's pump is under warranty, when was the last time we were there, what were the last five things we did, um, and then we want to get information uh, back. Okay, there we go. So we want to collect information on the, on the job site as well. Again, it doesn't have to be my technology. I actually have a customer in South Carolina who um, uses, um, this is a square, I assume you guys have to, uh, is square available up here? Yep. And so it's just a basic template where they literally can use a tablet to add items to the order, tabulate, put in information, and then um, they can email these back to the customer or email them back to the office. Again, it's in an organized, neat format, and it's in, um, it's in real time. So for me, um, the key to uh, running a really good service department and the tools that you need to grow your service department, um, you can only handle so much paperwork a day. I mean, at the end of the day, um, adding administrative staff to your service department to handle more paperwork is probably the least efficient way that, uh, that you can go. So um, really look into different technologies and, and the things that are available to you to um, build that, that service call foundation. At the end of the day, if you do all that, your customers will be um, exceedingly happy. I think that's, that's the key, yeah. right? So, uh, Dan, in terms of uh, the, the people that you deal with who come to you, would you say the majority of those people come with that stack of paper? And then that, is that part of what you guys see the most of is how do we take this? Well, it's, it's, what, you know, it's what the industry's been doing since the beginning of time, right? Yeah. It's, and it's old habits are hard, hard to break, but absolutely. I mean, I was guilty of it uh, myself. Um, you know, what happens is paperwork gets lost, 
Um, they forget to write things down. You know, all that information just sort of gets lost in the shuffle. Right, and nobody ever takes the paperwork and then transfers it back into a system because <coughs> then you're you're waiting for a person to do that, and um, there's never enough time to do that. I think one of the you know key things that I sell with my software, and again, I'm not up here to sell it, but um, you really. The, that person who's doing all that administrative data entry is probably a fairly high level person and could be more productive in your business in other areas. Why force them to you know, just basically transcribe the chicken scratch back, in, you know, back into a system? It's double and sometimes triple entry. So. Right, and if you are working on a paper system, just because you've entered the information back into a system at home, doesn't mean it goes back out the door again with that technician next time they're on site, which is exactly. the key yep. part of this, is to transcribe that information back to the next person that's on site. Absolutely right. So, um, Sorry, just, Ron, yep. can I uh, jump in here? One of our problems was uh, we had the paper system, and as I mentioned, we were doing 400, 450 jobs a day. So that's 450 pieces of paper. And something that you overlook is we reached this stage that we threw administration at this paper. But one of the big things is it was a horrible place to work because everybody had a pile of paper on their desk. So they'd come to work, they'd see that pile of paper, their motivation would go through the floor, and they'd hate it, like it was stressful. So apart from like customer expectations and profit and all the rest of it, one of the big things was eliminating that paper, making processes efficient so people actually felt they were doing something and not just shuffling paper. Um, that was probably one of the biggest key components of, of turning around my company, at least. Well, it's interesting that you say uh, specifically to your business that there was four or 500 sheets of paper, but what do you say to the people here who do 100? You know, is it still worth going through this procedure and how does the, the benefit spread throughout the company? I mean, one of them was, like you said, is, is motivation. Well, I think the key is, um, if you're doing 100 pieces of paper a day, the question you have to ask yourself is, do I want to get to 500 pieces of paper a day, right? Yeah. Um, that's really just a cost-benefit analysis. Do I really want to do 500 service calls a day? If the answer is yes, um, guess what? You can't get there from here. You can't get from 100 to 500 without crashing your business. It's yeah. just not possible. It's not. Yeah. No. So that's the question I guess we pose is, you know, how many people in the room see a benefit to being able to do a thousand service calls? Uh, I would, I'm sure yesterday Kevin was talking about what can we do to, to get that little increase. Well, here's one, here's an anchor that's stopping you from getting to that is if you're relying on a paper system, it's never going to get to that point. Just going digital, even if you didn't increase the 100 service calls, you're going to be 10, 15 percent add 10 or 15 percent to your bottom line just from administrative costs just the right the cost of doing you know cost of doing business is reduced significantly yeah. so do we have any questions from the audience specifically to these guys <laughs> yeah that's a, that's always expected <laughs> <laughs> i'll be here oh no worries yeah cheryl Um, retention's not really a program. Like, I, I do have that, that program where if I train them from a third party, not, not in-house, um, <clears throat> my employees, if they leave within 18 months, then they have to repay the, uh, the price of that training. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's a common thing. Um, do a search on the internet and you'll get contracts for that so that when you sign them up, you just communicate the price of this, uh, this program. So do you just take that off the pay? Uh, if they leave the company, if they quit, then yeah, it comes off their pay at the end of it. I sign it up in a contract so that they know straight up that it's, uh, that it's there. Do I always collect? Well, no. You know, do you have any kind of a bonus system or anything for employees? Or? Yep, yeah, we have, uh, it's, you can call it profit sharing if you want. Um, and it's, it is, honestly, it's all based on automation, on IT. So I, I actually took a different approach. Um, we, we paid our uh, service technicians at Dolphin in Dallas um, on commission, and one of my service technicians was the highest paid guy in the company. He was making more than I was as general manager, and I was perfectly happy. Um, but put him on commission, they're much more likely to um, you know, replace a time clock than they are to switch out a time clock motor, which was you know, time consuming and yeah. right. 
So, is there anyone else that has a technician that's uh, that is paid commission? Nobody. Huh. Well, that's interesting because that is a whole other side. I mean, if you want the guy to go into the backyard and decide, help the customer realize that they need a new pump, to help the customer realize they need a new heater, paying them commission is probably the only way that's going to happen. Yeah, it was for me. It was the. Um, uh, the, the best sales opportunity we had in the business. Right? Yeah, exactly. I was the one that used right. to do that myself because my techs, you know, were going in. I would always go and approve the job. So I spent most of my time traveling around. I was the one that knocked on the door and said, okay, the job is done now according to my standards. Um, but I noticed that, you know, your pump's about to fail. Would you like us to replace that now or would you like to wait till it fails? Right. And most of the time they'd say, yeah, 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 bring them back. So at the end of the day, he'd come back and change the pump. What kind of rate? Oh, what kind of rate for commission? You know, I paid. Um, we, you know, we paid a standard um, standard wage. It was an hourly hourly wage, but they were incented to sell. Um, you know, sell um, equipment. Um, my recollection is we paid them. You know, five or seven percent, something like that, and we just rolled it into the cost of the project. We did flat rate pricing, so if you needed a new pump, it was X number of dollars. Um, and that included the labor and the pump and the, all the parts and pieces, and we'll sort the inventory out later. But um, we did flat rate pricing, and they were paid a percentage on that. It was also really easy to report on. So, right. Yeah. So she's saying that in case you didn't hear it, is there a certain person who is the front uh, person for the service department rather than, than them always being stressed and being the negative position in the company, they started to pay them commission and now it's a happy place to work because they're proactive about receiving service calls. It's also, you know, an area of your business that's just inherently um, inefficient. Um, doing, I mean, I could, again, talk all day on this subject and often do, but um, inventory, like, you know, tracking inventory in your trucks. I paid um, two bonuses a year to uh, all my service technicians based on the inventory accuracy of their vehicle. If you're within 98%, here's a bonus. Yep. And then everybody was in a second bonus pool. If everybody's within 98%, then we give out a second bonus. But if one guy isn't within 98 percent everybody gets cheated out of the second bonus and it's not my problem go take it up with him yeah. and what i found was that literally um every other saturday they were in helping each other you know count their trucks and they were running back in the office and saying hey i need to add two bottles of filter cleaner to mrs jones's service call i did last week because i forgot um, yeah so. we we did the same thing we had a uh, policy that all of the trucks, I, I think we had 12 or 14, and each one of them was its own business unit and that uh, if come Friday your vehicle wasn't uh, clean, if it wasn't uh, taken care of before you left, everybody lost the bonus. Um, so you would see on Fridays when people came in, uh, if the first guy got back to the shop early and took off um, and everybody lost their bonuses, well on Monday he would, uh, he would have a lot to deal with. So it, it rarely happened. Yeah, peer, peer pressure. Oh yeah, the peer that, pressure yeah. was incredible. So, I mean, we did it with, uh, it was uh, basically we had a food allowance. Uh, we would give them a bonus uh, for, for, you know, eating out on the road because it costs them more to do that. But to keep them from driving all the way home because at the time we hadn't put GPSs into our trucks yet, people were, you know, driving all over the place to save themselves a couple of bucks on lunch. So instead, we gave them cash to make sure that they didn't do that and they ate on, along the road. I mean, once we put in GPSs, it was a different story. But uh, it certainly kept people um, focused on, you know, making sure that, that they got that bonus at the end of the week. So you're using laptops out in the field? Yeah. Um, you know, I get resistance to that all the time. When I'm discussing technology out in the field, oh, I could never give my guys cell phones. They drop them in the pool every other day. <laughs> Um, but, but I have to tell you, um, that, like the really highly successful service companies that I, that I work with are using tablets and laptops, you know, in their trucks. They have to give those guys access to information and to be able to collect information in real time. Yeah. I, um, uh, I thought I'd get resistance from my techs putting laptops in the trucks. Um, they loved it yeah. because they weren't reliant on the, uh, on the, front, the front girl that's taking the service calls or the, the guy that's taking the service calls. They had all the information at hand, so they could uh, 
performed, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and then my call volume in the store um, went down by probably 30, 40 percent because they're not phoning three or four times for a job. Hey, what, uh, what did we do last month? Can I have their phone number? Uh, it's all at hand. And uh, I personally probably saved about five hours a day of my work um, because I wasn't briefing all the techs in the morning and giving them their stack of papers and saying, don't forget this. And then I wasn't debriefing them at the end of the day. I'd just go in and, uh, well, actually, I can do it with my phone right now go in and check all the jobs that they went to and, uh, and move them around schedule and process all the information's at the fingers. Well, just think how much time it saves with the uh, calls. Oh, what's the uh, gate code for this place again? Yeah. Oh, remember, that's the house with the uh, a valve that's always broken and you have to tap it twice to make it work, you know? Or I forgot they had a dog. It, right, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, all of that stuff saves so much time and, and energy increases efficiency just with technology. I, I can give you phone numbers. I mean, unsolicited uh, customers that are using the mobile technology and they, they figure their technicians are doing three to four more service calls per week on average because yeah. they have this technology at their fingertips. Yeah. So. Probably on the low side. And from a customer satisfaction perspective, I was talking about my experience previously and uh, what we found is when we put GPSs into the cars, at first everyone was like, oh, you can't track me, what are you doing? Uh, you know, the, the techs were upset about it, but guess what? When we started receiving the calls back at the office, hey, where is that guy? And we say, oh, Mrs. Brand, uh, he just left this place and I can see he's heading over to your place they no longer got that angry customer at the door that they used to get saying, where the hell have you been? So it, it became a positive thing even for the technicians who at first thought it was a little bit too big brother for them. They, uh, even they started to appreciate the technology that was you know, imposed on them. And the level of customer service, I mean, people loved it when we'd call and say, hey, they just finished this job, they're heading over and, you know, they're on Elm Street right now, they'll be over there. Uh, suddenly, it puts you up here, and if you're charging that much, suddenly what you're charging makes more sense. And we didn't even talk, touch on mapping technology and how that's, how that's evolved. Your ability to really um, do smart scheduling graphically yeah. Yeah. Um, using mapping technology is huge. And of course, everybody's phone has a GPS in it now. So I mean, there, there's ways to leverage technology that you've already got. So yeah, yeah that's, that's yeah. a whole other conversation for another time. But uh, is, if, does anybody else have any other questions? Again, these guys are around uh, to talk about. It's a topic they enjoy talking about. It's a topic I enjoy talking about as well. So feel free to ask us anything about that. Perhaps we'll expand on it in our uh, spring sessions as well. And uh, maybe we can just show how you can implement one or two of these things from a, a technical perspective. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate right. it. Thanks for coming up.